Are we ready? Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming to tonight's debate. Uh, first of all, um, just if anybody has questions for the candidates, we have index cards and pens over there. Just please feel free at any point to just come up here and place your question on the table, and we'll get to it before the end of the debate. So um, the candidates for selectmen, um, please, um, Mr. Ewell, start with your opening statement. Thank you very much. <coughs> um, first, uh, let me thank uh, Al at Advanced photo for uh, pulling this all together. I approached Al about three weeks ago for him to uh, possibly do this if he was interested in, in uh, uh, um, running this program. Uh, the goal was to reach as many people as we possibly could in North Reading because it's really important that we reach out and, and people become more involved uh, regardless of their opinion on issues and so on. Um, I also want to thank uh, NORCAM for uh, coming through with the access uh, station and uh, with the uh, streaming as well. The access station is important for the seniors. Uh, they, they use that probably more than most. Um, and then there's the uh, uh, North Reading Community Connection. I believe they're streaming as well on Facebook and I want to uh, thank uh, them as well. Uh, I also want to thank everybody who is attending here uh, and, and for those of who are watching either live or on uh, streaming or on the computer or on TV. And most importantly, I want to thank my wife, Irene, for believing, believing in me. Um, Irene and I moved here in 1995, raised our two children, uh, who received a uh, good education through the North Reading School District. Uh, once again, publicly, I, I, I thank the school committee and both the past and present uh, members for their dedication. Um, I am Jeff Ewell, and I am running for re-election for selectman. Uh, I'm a two-term selectman, of which I am the, uh, on 13 subcommittees, three negotiating teams, a member of the Capital Improvement uh, Planning Committee, a liaison for the Northeast Municipal Gas Pipeline, which we successfully stopped the Tennessee Gas Pipeline from coming through uh, North Reading, coming through the state. Um, I work with uh, state and uh, U.S. congressional officials, uh, I'm a consensus candidate, uh, and uh, I'm transparent. Uh, I'm not secretive in, in what I do. If I can't say it publicly at this table, I don't say it anyplace else. Um, on my Facebook, I've uh, been given the, uh, been told that uh, I have a track record uh, working with local and state leaders and education advocates alike to secure additional needed funding for education and for local aid. Although I'm politically involved, I am not a politician. I'm an independent Socratic thinker. I question all that we do, and so should you. I look for a solution that is best for all concerned. How we come to a solution is more important than the result, because the content determines uh, the quality of the result and its value. That is my approach. That's how I uh, look at things when I sit on the Board of Selectmen and I learn from all the board members and I gather information. I do not try to be an, a person who has all the answers for everybody. Uh, I bring them together and I work towards a, a solution that will be beneficial for everybody. Thank you. Mr. Schultz. Hi, my name is Andy Schultz, and I'm asking for your vote on May 2nd. Uh, I'm a homeowner here in town. I'm a parent with kids in the school. I'm a business owner in town, and I'm the past president of the Reading, North Reading Chamber of Commerce. I'm running because I want to make this town better. We need to improve the commercial aspect of our town in the sense that we need to raise our economic tax base on the commercial side, which will help lower the burden on residents. Our seniors especially are most hard hit by property taxes. Oftentimes, it's the largest bill they have in their monthly bills, we need to keep property taxes in check on the residential side. We need money for the schools. Our schools are top-notch. They need to stay top-notch. In order to keep top-notch schools, we need more money. We can't tax the residents any further. We need to invest in infrastructure, such as sewerage on Concord Street and later Route 28, and develop those areas so we have higher appraised buildings, new growth in this town, increase the commercial tax base, which will increase the money to the town, enable us to do the things we want to do but not hit the residents. That's the key. We cannot hit the residents any further. 
Uh, I also want to thank all the people who made this happen tonight and all the people that are watching at home, uh, notably Advanced Photo, NORCAM, the transcript, and the North Reading Community Connection on Facebook. I know a lot of you folks are watching online. I think that's great. I think it's important that everybody knows where the candidates stand on all the issues. It's very important that you know that what I'm going to tell you is what I'm going to tell you. It's very straight and straightforward. There's no hitting agenda. I'm a business guy. I just come off my term as president of the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce. I've worked a lot of selectmen in Reading on things like senior tax relief. I understand how business works, and it's very important that we understand that we need to increase our infrastructure. If we want Route 28 and Conquer Street to look the same way, we can continue down the same path. If we want to improve it, have restaurants, retail, car dealerships, all the like, hotels, we need sewerage, we need infrastructure in place that's going to enable us to get to that goal, but we need to do it in a way that's fiscally responsible and does not hit the residential taxpayer. And for those reasons, I'm going to be asking for your vote on May 2nd. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, you've both been campaigning on the issue of um, tax relief for the seniors and the burden that they face as taxpayers. One of the audience members has asked a question um, just to further elaborate on what have you done or will you do to assist seniors with their residential tax bills? And that would be for both of you. However, um, Mr. Schultz, if you'd like to start. Well, first thing, we have programs in place that are underutilized. I know the uh, Taxation Aid Committee, Aid Committee, the TAC, was, been a, was very active years ago. I know Mr. Yule's been the chairman of the liaison of that committee for the last three years, and in the last three years, it has not given out one grant, as far as I know. So that's an under, underutilized group that Mr. Yule chairs himself, or is a liaison to, has not been used. Also, as I mentioned, with respect to my uh, tenure as the president of the Chamber of Commerce, I worked extensively with Selectman John Halsey in Reading on behalf of the business community in crafting their senior tax relief bill, which was passed last year by the town of Reading. What they did was essentially have the businesses help pay for some of the senior tax relief in a sense that some of the non-senior residents and the business owners paid for it that enabled the seniors to stay in their homes. The problem that we have, and I hear it all the time as a real estate attorney, there are many, many seniors or people that are empty nesters leaving our town because they can't afford the property taxes. You have people who lived in this town 30, 40, 50 years. Those are the people we need to protect. And unless we have economic stimulus and utilize the programs that are in place, we're never going to get there. We need to grow the pot, and we need to do it at the expense of the commercial base, not at the expense of the residents. It's very important. Mr. Ewell? Yes. Um, <clears throat> with regard to the Taxation Aid Committee, we've had various meetings. And in, in many of the cases that we have not been able to uh, identify uh, families and families have not come forward on some of the um, efforts that we have put out there. Uh, the committee is, is made up of, it's supposed to be made up of five people and it's uh, very difficult to get uh, membership uh, to participate or people in, within the community to participate in the program. Um, so even though through uh, various efforts, uh, it, if, if the way the program is designed, if people don't come forward, even though we make it aware to them, if they don't come forward, then there's nothing that we can provide them uh, uh, because of that. Um, as far as tax relief uh, for seniors is concerned, and uh, real estate property uh, taxes uh, do come into play, uh, the, 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 the constant increase of taxes. Uh, uh, last year, I believe, I, I did a quick review uh, no, put it, make it a lengthy review on uh, how our tax levels have been going up. And our tax levels have been going up at a rate of 5.5% on average, which is a high number uh, considering that um, we have Prop 2.5, and, and so that makes it more than double the amount that the taxes should be going up. It's very easy to say that uh, we can um, uh, uh, take care of the uh, uh, seniors and say that uh, we want to keep the, the, the taxes down, but we have to find a way of doing it. You have a lot of information that you've expressed, and you, you have a lot of people that are working with you, giving you uh, answers to questions that are going to be very uh, complicated to Actually, answer. they're my answers, yeah. not my friends. Uh, well, uh, I see that you're coached very well. All right. it's, no, I'm it's educated, very, not it's coached. It's very, very important that the, that the uh, tax uh, situation be reviewed. Uh, in such a way that uh, we're able to reach out to the seniors and, and make sure that they're not overburdened the way they are right now. Can I respond to that? Yes. Mr. Yo, you've been on the board for six years. What's one proposal you have put forward to for respect to senior tax relief? I just gave an example of what I did as a Chamber of Commerce president, which helped the folks in Reading. 
you have the TAC, which has not given out one grant in three years. Now, you may say it's not publicized. Well, that's your fault then as a liaison. No, it no, it's publicized. publicized. It's well, publicized. They, don't if they don't respond, it. no. Okay. If they don't respond to the advertisements that have been put into the newspaper, then we do not go out and, and seek individuals that way. It doesn't, the, the system doesn't All work I'm that way. All I'm saying, it's fine to talk about Hawaii and help seniors. I actually have helped seniors. I don't know what you've done besides talk about it. Okay, one of the things that I've approached, and I, I've approached the uh, Board of Selectmen on numerous uh, uh, discussions, I've asked that the that we manage our budgets in such a way that we manage them at a two and a percent a two percent growth rate rather than a two and a half percent growth rate, so we don't have to increase the rates beyond uh, uh, the the levels that we we are doing right now. Yeah, if I could speak right. to that, sure, that's financially irresponsible. If we cannot make the but we have a budget gap on both the town side and the school side right now, about 100,000 on the town side, a little over 600,000 potentially on the school side. You want to, you got prop two and a half, you want to cut that to make it prop two. We can't even make the budget on two and a half. You want to take 20% off of that. What jobs are you going to cut in our schools and in our public safety and our fire and our police to meet your financial goals if you cut a half a percent out of it? There's you, the math doesn't work. And you you need to increase the commercial tax base. You, you, you manage your, your expenditures so that uh, you, you can cover your costs and you try to do it uh, uh, very, very carefully. We can't continue to spend our way through solutions. That's what we seem to be doing quite often. All right? If you manage yourself effectively and efficiently, you can find savings. There are savings out there and they can be accomplished. With, with all due respect, though, we, we have a shortfall right now on the budget that we have right now at 2.5%. We haven't even made up that shortfall, and you're talking about cutting it further. Instead, in my opinion, you should be looking at economic expansion. I'm not talking oh, let me, about... Let me finish, please. Let me finish. I think you should be looking at economic expansion on the commercial side, have the new growth, which will increase the tax base, not put the burden on the residents. Again, I ask you to ask the question, what police, fire, or school jobs are you going to cut to make the budget you're proposing? I'm not you talking have to about cut cutting. jobs. I'm not talking about... I'm talking about managing. There's a big difference between the two. And as far as the commercial end is concerned, that's part of our strategic plan. All right. right it's, it's, this it's, isn't it's, fantasy land. Do, I, I've run a business. Is, I no run a business. There's no fantasy here. There's no fantasy. You just simply, you, you go online, you look at a strategic plan. We have a commercial base. I'm involved in all those things. I'm involved in all those discussions, okay? I'm not the one that likes to get up there and stand in front of everybody, but I'm behind the scenes. I am involved in those discussions and in, in looking to, to manage ourselves in an, a responsible and efficient and effective way, which way government is supposed to to be managed. Every year, we, well, not every year, I don't think last year we had an issue with our, with our budget with the, uh, with, on the town side. On the school side, many times we have issues. And, 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 and to their credit, uh, you know, the, the school committee works as hard as they possibly can uh, to keep, uh, uh, you know, their budgets in, in line with what, with the growth that we have. So I, I, I give them credit for that, all right? But we, we must constantly look at reducing our costs or managing ourselves so that the costs don't go out of whack. Let's get ready for another issue, but if you have a couple quick uh, follow-up. Just one last final things. question. I just submit to the voters out there watching tonight, what you just heard, cutting 20% off of a budget that's already short, is going to have less police, less firefighters, less teachers in our schools. That's just a simple math. You can spin it any way you want. I run a business. I know how businesses budget. I know how they work. I know how the real world works. You can't cut 20% off something that's short to begin with. The math doesn't make sense. If I may, yeah, we are now listening to a politician. This is how a politician speaks, okay? You have to go to, you, know, you think about it, you have all this knowledge, right? In three years, you've only been to one Board of Selectmen's meeting. That's incorrect. Okay? I watch them on TV all the time. Oh, I'm sure you do, okay? Yeah. That's a that's good yeah. explanation. But you've only been before us, and the time that you were before us, was on an issue that had nothing to do with the Board of Selectmen. Was I advocating for okay. a business in town? Uh, you were yes, I was. Thank you. you. You were advocating for bark and roll, all right, and you were complaining that, that you know, I didn't know what you were complaining about because it didn't make really much sense because it had nothing to do with us. You should have been in front of the CPC. That's where you should have been. So why you were complaining and bloviating to us, I have no idea. I leaned over to my uh, counterpart and I said, why is he here? Okay, we'll move on to the next uh, yeah, one. You get the last word on yeah, the next issue, okay? Fine. We have two readers, who, uh, two um, 
audience members who have asked about the question of recreational marijuana as well as medical marijuana, if you would um, be willing to um, just explain your positions on that. Uh, who was the first? He went first. Mr. Uh, you went first. Uh, we go first okay, at this so, time. Okay. Uh, okay. On the marijuana issue, I'm against. No, I no you went, went first to in the first question, Mr. Yule. No. No, no, you didn't. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I am paying attention. Just sure, want to let you guys yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, let's go uh, uh, look at both of them. You, is this a dual question on both? Uh, uh, two of the uh, audience members are asking where the selectman candidates stand on medical marijuana as well as recreational marijuana in town. Okay. Well, uh, on uh, medical marijuana, uh, that was brought before the board uh, through uh, Representative Brad Jones, uh, the chairman of, and vice chairman of the uh, Board of Selectmen invited uh, a company to come and present uh, their um, uh, program uh, to opening up a dispensary uh, here in town. Now, as we should all know that uh, by law, the state approved that a, uh, a dispensary can, uh, is by law allowed to be built, uh, open up in a town. Okay, um, we took steps with the CPC many years ago to identify a location so where we can put a medical marijuana dispensary. It happens to be in my neighborhood, okay, uh, in the West, West Village part of town. And, and that was the selection that was made. By law, if someone wants to come before the Board of Selectmen and request to open up a facility, we're pretty much required to listen to them and listen to what they have to propose. Right. The town of North Reading, at 56% of the vote, voted in support of medical marijuana. So my view at that point was the town had made a decision by popular vote, by majority vote, to allow this to, to happen. Okay. So we entertained the, um, uh, the company that was involved. It didn't pass for some good reasons, all right, but it didn't pass, all right. But as far as if someone comes before the board again, we would be obligated to listen to them for <coughs> medical marijuana. In the case of uh, recreational marijuana, the town voted 54% against recreational marijuana. And the town took steps in that regard. And we took steps to say that we, we put it, I, presented warrant number six on that to not, uh, to prohibit uh, the sale of uh, recreational marijuana in the town. I supported that. We're gonna have on the May 2nd election, that's gonna be up on as a ballot question. So I do not support the sale of recreational marijuana in the town. All right, my opponent uh, uh, is on record as saying that, you know, he's okay with people grow marijuana in, the, in their homes. Okay, he was okay with that. I'm not sure no, what well, record that is. That was in the uh, transcript, I think, in one of your, your first letters. But in any event, um, so I'm, I'm not for recreational marijuana in the town. Right. Okay. I understand that as far as the medical marijuana is concerned, the Board of Selectmen do not have a plan to implement a medical marijuana facility or to seek a medical marijuana. That, there was a suggestion made at the, at, at the meeting where we said, well, why don't we put out an RFP? And that was made by one of the Board of Selectmen. Mr. Um, on the marijuana issue, I, I agree with Mr. Yule, both against recreational marijuana. I don't care what people do in their own homes in the sense that I don't want marijuana, recreational marijuana stores in North Reading. I think we both are in agreement on that issue. Where we disagree, is on a medicinal issue. Now, there's a lot of things the voters need to know about the medicinal marijuana law that was passed about five years ago. First of all, when that was passed, people didn't realize if a town gives a medicinal, recre or medicinal marijuana license, it automatically comes with a recreational license. Right now, the way the law is written, and I spoke with Rep Representative Jones about this about a week ago, the licenses are in tandem. You can't separate the recreational from the medicinal. So if you give somebody a medicinal license, they have a recreational license, and there's very little this town can do to stop that if they later determine we'd like to have recreational too, which of course they're going to want to because that's where the money is. The cast group that came in that Mr. Ewell voted for was on the wrong side of a three to two vote. They had a lot of issues. Now keep in mind for the folks at home, it's a cash business. They're not allowed to accept credit cards, these marijuana dispensaries, okay? 
they, there's only one bank that I know of that will touch them because it's got to be a state chartered bank. Marijuana is still illegal federally. People seem to forget that. We have an attorney general in Washington that's already spoken out that he may try to shut these companies down. Whether that happens or not, I don't know. It's just it's a, fe you know, a data point out there. I spoke with the police chief here in North Reading about this. It's a net negative to the town. He spoke with some of his counterparts in Colorado who have been dealing with this issue for the last few years since Colorado legalized marijuana. And from what I understand from the police out there, it's been a nightmare. Um, our police chief feels whatever money we bring in is going to be offset by the amount of extra police costs you're going to have. Let me speak to that a little further, if I may. You're going to, the, the company that Mr. Ewell voted for has a growth site, I believe, out in Fitchburg, out in the Route 2 corridor. I think it's in Fitchburg. You're going to have vans with hundreds of thousands of dollars of product in cash coming in out of North Reading all day long to a site on Concord Street. It's just a crime scene waiting to happen, number one. Never mind the impact on our youth. I know Mr. Ewell was very involved with, I believe it was the community impact team um, throughout the process, and he was on board with them. They're obviously against the marijuana issue and then voted for this company at the last minute. What's most disturbing about that vote, the company had somebody on their board or in their higher-ups that had a felony record, number one. Number two, they hadn't paid their taxes in a couple of years. So you got a company that's a cash business. The town is going to be relying on what they're declaring as their income to determine what kind of revenue we get. Yet they don't pay their taxes, yet somebody involved with them has a felony, and my opponent votes for them. To me, that's just poor judgment. And I think as far as medicinal marijuana, we've really got to vet anybody that comes in here. Um, you know, I would not have voted for the cast group for the reasons I just articulated. And I think until the state decouples that law, meaning you don't have to automatically give a recreational if you give medicinal, because what's next? Is 7-Eleven going to sell it? Is the convenience store over here going to smell? So it's going to be like lottery tickets. We have to know what's going on. The law is too new. With any law that comes out, you can see what the legislature says in the statute, but until the SJC rules on it, we don't really know what the, the nuts and bolts of it are. It's important that we let this flush out, not rush into it, and I would not have, wrote, I would not have voted for that group that came into town a few months ago. Mr. Yield, do you have any follow-up? Uh, <clears throat> uh, yes. The, the agreement that we had with Cass was that they would not have uh, used that license, all right? That was an agreement that was in the contract for, uh, uh, for the agreement that we had with them. So we addressed that issue uh, because we were aware of that, and obviously it would be a concern. So we, we did ad address that issue. So. And Mr. Schultz, you had uh, that, the last to me, word. That's Is there just, anything else on this? Yeah, that's just naive. I mean, there's no way legally that would be enforceable. If they wanted to put the recreational in two years later, even though they said they weren't going to do it, we couldn't stop them. The way the law is written right now. Until the law is changed in Boston, we shouldn't be touching this. Uh, here's a question that one of the um, audience members has submitted uh, for both of you. And um, Mr. Yule, I believe this one would be yours first. Uh, do you have a conflict of interest in voting on any issues that impact our town? Do you have a conflict of interest? That's ju I'm just reading from the uh, right. question. Okay. Well, that's kind of a you know, tricky question, you know. Interesting. Uh, one, it's so a yeah. very interesting question. Uh, my, my wife works for the school department, and if you want to call that a conflict of interest, then feel, so free, feel free to do so. Okay? Not you. I mean, you know, whoever. Okay? Ask that question. It's, it, it's, it's a minor question. I do not have any negotiations with the schools at all. Okay? I uh, did the schools have, have their negotiations to do, and so on. We have ours, all right? So anything uh, related to that, I'm not involved in. The, the, the area that I uh, am required to recuse myself is when we have the discussions uh, with uh, the health care, because the health care is done by the town, all right? And if that happens, you know, uh, if that's a discussion. I have recused myself, okay, uh, from that. Uh, I have no conflicts at all, and uh, very importantly, health care on the town side is one of the biggest expenses in the budget, and we need somebody that understands health care and can help negotiate it. Okay. Excuse me. Hold on. Yeah. First of all, I understand health care. That's not, that's not the issue, okay? Um, uh, I may argue that I, I'm, not, I'm not sure I agree, agree with the required conflict of interest, but I understand health care. Uh, following up, um, the same audience member asks about your skill sets and leadership abilities that you would bring to the Board of Selectmen. Uh, basically, already would describe them. Uh, actually, I'm sorry, Mr. Um, yep. uh, as far as leadership, my background is I have undergraduate degrees in history and economics. I have a master's in business association, and I have a law degree. 
I also was elected by my peers, as I stated before, as the president of the Reading North Reading Chamber of Commerce. I'm very active in a lot of community groups. I'm a member of the uh, North Reading Union Congregational Church, where I chair the committee that handles the investments and the, um, the money part of the church. Okay. Yes. Um, I believe in working with people. And as far as leadership is concerned, uh, when, you, when you bring ideas together, that's what leaders do. Uh, I'm a very Socratic uh, approach to, to my, my thought processes. And uh, I work with people. I talk with people. I communicate with my, my uh, 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 board members all right, on issues. Uh, I've had discussions today with uh, the chairman uh, you know, regarding issues. So we, we, we work together. Uh, leadership is something that evolves. It's not something that's demanded. You, know, you don't say, I'm a leader. Uh, and uh, you know I can I can I can lead or something like that. You know people follow leaders. Leaders don't pull people along with them. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. Um, one of the audience members asks, "What are you most proud of regarding our community?" That was um, I keep on yeah. forgetting your. But. That's that would be me, as in Jeff Ewell. <laughs> 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 um, you know, th there's a lot of lot to be proud of. Um, uh, the people, I think that that's the most to be proud of. We have a, a a group of people in this town, and I say I mean the whole town. I don't mean just you know a specific group. We have a lot of people who care about the town. Uh, I like to think I'm one of them. Uh, that's why I'm a, a selectman because I like to give back to the community. I like to work hard for the community. I like to think that my ideas are, 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 are positive ideas uh, for the community. Uh, but I think I think the people. Uh, um, um, Nick um, McGrath, for example, is a young boy to be proud of. He uh, I found out that he was on one of the two uh, ships that was uh, uh, out uh, that uh, attacked that bombed uh, Iran. He was on one of those ships. We have one of our own there. Uh, I found that out. Uh, <laughs> the mother's worried. She's running, and the dad's happy. You know, <laughs> some of those things. But uh, and and during the <coughs> uh, uh, bombing of the uh, 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 Boston Marathon a few years ago, we had uh, one of our own uh, uh, young people who was in the tent. I'm, excuse me for forgetting his name at the moment, but uh, he was then he helped out. So. We have people in this community who care tremendously about uh, 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 the sense of uh, pride that you get from North Reading. And that, and that comes from the parents, that comes from the school system, that comes from uh, people who work around town. Uh, we're really, you know, it's the people. It really boils down to the people. Okay. Mr. Schultz. Uh, obviously the people, but the number one thing I'm proud of in our town is the schools. Uh, I'm a real estate attorney. I do a lot of closings. I meet a lot of people who are moving into the town. I always ask at the closing table, what brought you to North Reading? And the answer is always the schools, the schools, the schools. We have a town that's 20, 30 minutes from Boston. You can still get land. You're not living on a postage stamp in a lot of areas of our town. Um, you know, it's comfortable. You have nice people. It's a friendly town. It, it's a great town, but the schools, I think, are the crown jewel of our if you ask for one thing, I think it's the schools is what I'm most proud of of our town. Okay. If I may, I'm, I'm glad you said that because um, years ago when we moved into town in 1995, I became very involved in, in uh, and very proactive in, in uh, uh, fighting for the schools uh, to get us to the point to where we are right now. Uh, we have a good school system. Your children are benefiting from some of the hard work uh, that uh, people like Deanna Castro and Marcy Bailey and myself and Jeff Simons uh, have done. Uh, some have done more. I've done, you know, I guess my fair share maybe, and some have done a lot more than I have, and that's why we have uh, good schools. And, 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 the, and, the, good, and, and the school committee, uh, you know, I'm sure they appreciate the efforts that, that have been put forth to give them uh, uh, structures that can... Uh, um, uh, be up to date. I mean, they were pretty bad back then. I mean, uh, we went through the time when there was uh, half days on Wednesday. So um, uh, I feel very good uh, have, having played a part uh, in uh, whether it's a small part or a big part, of playing a part in uh, having the schools uh, be what they are today. Mr. Schultz, do you have anything to add? No, I agree. I think the schools are in our parks. The okay. East River Park, I live across the street from it. It's a, you know, you get, I walk the dog over there all the time. and. I always talk to people in there, and 
hey, where are you from? Andover, Reading, North Andover. That park draws people from other towns. It's so nice. And I think that's another thing that the, part, the community should be proud of. And the things that the Hillview Commission has been able to do in this town between the, the football field, you know, the parks, all, all that kind of stuff, I think it really speaks well to the town. Yeah. And, and excuse me, that comes back to the people. It's all the people in town making these things happen. Another question from the audience. What are your biggest concerns with North Reading's future? Mr. Schultz, if you want to start. Yeah, the lack of a commercial tax base. You ride down 28 through Andover, you ride through Reading, you ride through North Reading, and which of these things does not look like the other, as I always used to joke? Um, our downtown area needs some help. Our commercial areas need help. Uh, we are not going to be able to build nice buildings, build new restaurants, new retail, new hotels, car dealerships, and the like, until we get sewerage in those areas. We need to start on Concord Street and then work our way up 28. Now, a lot of people have come before here during campaigns and, and mentioned what I'm mentioning. The one difference we have now that we didn't have in the past is we have money from the JT Berry property. We're going to have money coming in from the sale and also the resulting property tax revenue coming in when those over 55 homes are built. That money has to be invested properly. It has to be invested into infrastructure. I think it's important that we don't spend that money on one-off projects, but rather spend that money so it gives an investment to the town for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Thank you. Mr. Yule. Yeah, I think you have been watching on TV because I think you've been listening to me. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, it, it's correct. I mean, we, we have to uh, work on a commercial base. We have to work on the uh, uh, water discharge. Uh, we have to uh, work on Main Street. This is all part of uh, smart streets and so on. Uh, we, th these are all part of our strategic plan that we we have in, you know, that we have that we're working on. Okay, um, I've added to, to our strategic plan the idea of the rail trail. I'd like to have that you know, come through our town if we, if we can uh, uh, work that out. And I've been having active discussions on that uh, right now, okay? It's, 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 it's an addition. It would be perfect for the uh, complement our, um, uh, it's the Triver Park and, and, and so on. So uh, the, the commercial base is, is, is very important. It's gonna take some time. I know a bunch of years ago we came up, there was a plan, um, 40, million dollars to put in a, uh, a, a sewer system running from uh, uh, Martin's Pond down Main Street out to uh, Concord Street and then before the schools were built out to the schools so that the schools would be able to hook into that when we build a new school. Um, that obviously has changed but uh, uh, so that was 40 million dollars I don't know if it's 10 years ago or now or something like that, but it's 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 a while ago. So we know it's not that anymore, all right. And the JT Berry twenty you know nineteen million dollars that we expect to be getting from that isn't quite going to cover that uh, thing. But 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 yeah, it's it's money that we could use. And and, and I've emphasized uh, to the Economic Development Committee, of which I am a non-voting member, but I am a member nonetheless. Um, you know, I'd like to see our our money go a good portion of that. And what that is, it's hard to say because we have to look at many things. Uh, I want to see a lot, of, a good portion of that money to go to economic development solutions, so that we we can work uh, towards the things, uh, you know, such as wastewater and so on. Okay. Mr. Schultz, do you if, have anything to a add? A couple things on that. With respect to the rail trail, the rail trail has two bridges that would need to be built in order to make the rail trail work. The land utilization committee, I think it was about maybe four or five years ago, um, looked at refixing one of the bridges on the Smith property. Back then it was $350,000 for one bridge, probably a half million dollars or so now for each bridge. So it's a million dollars in bridges for the rail trail. To me, that should be issue number 75 on our list, almost similar to the high school football field bathrooms. That's, on the big scheme of things, that's not the highest thing on the priority list. We need to increase the commercial tax base. Now, if you, a basic understanding of finance, what we can do is we can invest most of that JT Berry money in municipal bonds, take the money back, use the monthly interest that we get on that to pay debt service for financing and bonding all these projects so we can keep our principal, yet build the things that we need. If you look at the strategic plan, you got a fire station that's going to be rebuilt at some point. You got the town hall we're sitting in that's nearing the end of its useful life. You need senior housing. You need a new senior center. You need all these things, and you cannot tax the residents any further. You have to have an idea financially, look at this. How do you structure this down the road where you can do these things but not hammer the residents? That's where I think you need somebody on the board with a financial background that understands how the financing works. I work with commercial developers. I know what the appetite is for Concord Street if you have sewage. I agree with Mr. Yule. It's not like we're going to have skyscrapers up there overnight. It's going to take time to flip that or stretch a road over, but you're going to see things happening there. All those trucking firms and industrial areas, 
those people that own that are going to realize, I can sell this land for this now because there's sewage. And you're going to get developers coming in. It'll happen, but you've got to put the infrastructure in place. And you have to properly finance this where you can protect the principal from J.T. Barry, but yet have the revenue stream to bond and finance these projects down the road. You can do both, but you have to do it smartly. Oh, um, okay. Yes, and, and all of the things that uh, uh, Mr. Schultz is talking about, we are talking about. We have been talking about for years, and we've been working at And we've been working in that direction. And, and the J.T. Berry is, is a step in the right direction. It's going to be very helpful to us on how to manage those funds. But those, those funds have to be managed frugally and carefully because uh, I know that everybody in town that, that has a special interest wants that money. And, I'm, you know, we have to be careful with that because it's very easy. It's gone like that, and I don't want that. I was going to ask if you could both elaborate on actually as potential um, for your next um – couple of years. What do you see with this JT Berry money coming in? Do you have any specific visions or ideas with that? Um, you were just speaking, Mr. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't look at it as having a vision of how to spend it. I look at a vision of how to manage it, okay? There are going to be many different opportunities. There are going to be many ideas. People have great ideas, and they're going to bring them forward. Board members have good ideas. Uh, they're going to bring them forward, all right? So, uh, you know, I work with those ideas. As, as I said, I'm a, content, a consensus type uh, uh, person. I take all the information in and I work with it. If an idea uh, that I have that I want to bring forward, I'm going to bring it forward or I'm going to extrapolate off of someone else's idea because that's what five members of the board do. It's never one person that comes up and comes with a whip and says, okay, everybody, let's get in line and let's do this. All right, we work together. So. Mr. I do have a concrete plan. Assuming we get roughly 18 million or so from JT Berry, and that's a floating number depending upon when it closes, um, I would take three to four million of that, invest that in Concord Street, and what I'd call the seed money to get sewage started there. Now you're going to eventually get a lot of that back through commercial betterments to the better betterments to the property owners on that stretch. I think the rest of it you invest, and you can use the income stream off those investments to bond other projects. So you can build the things you want to build, maintain your principal, so you have a sound financial footing moving forward but yet not have to wait to build the things. I had an opportunity to tour the fire station during the campaign, and if you saw where our firefighters are sleeping upstairs, you'd be shocked. Uh, also, every so many years, the trucks cycle out of there. The way the trucks are getting bigger, the next truck they buy is not gonna fit through the garage door. The trucks are bigger nowadays from when that was built. Um, you know, our police always have needs, our schools have needs, but we can't hit the residents any further because the seniors get hurt the most by that. We have to keep property taxes in check on the residential side but have new growth on the commercial side. And you're only gonna do that if you invest in the infrastructure. Holding on to the money and, and spending it on this and that, that's not gonna do it. You have to put the infrastructure so you can get the nice buildings in. If you're a commercial business owner and you wanna bring something to North Reading, right now, where are you gonna put it? There's no space to put it in for real nice things. We can do these things. If you get a hotel on Concord Street, guess what? A restaurant's gonna come right next to it. And then another business, and then another business. And you're gonna eventually have a, look at Walker's Brook and Reading, what that was 15 years ago where the Jordan's furniture and the uh, Home Depot is. That was just kind of swampland. Now it's a big commercial area. There's also the Daskin Road project. Uh, I encourage people to look online up in Andover. That's a mixed use development. I recommend mixed use where you have retail on the bottom, you have uh, residential over the top. Um, and you do it in a way that doesn't drain the schools, it's like with the over 55 and Pulte homes. If it, people are over 55, they're probably not gonna have kids. Every child that goes to our schools is about roughly a $14,000 bill to the town, give or take a few hundred bucks. So you have a family of four that moves in with two kids in schools. Even if you're getting $10,000 a year in property taxes, the town's spending $28,000 to educate those kids. You just, we have to do the math. We have to do smart things. We have to invest in the commercial areas because they bring money in, but they don't drain the schools. Okay. Yes, and, um, and you happen to be correct because that's what we're doing. That's what we're looking at uh, right now. Uh, with regard to the uh, fire department, uh, you know, we've already allocated funds for that to be taken care of. All right, so we did that about a year ago, and that's, that's in, the, in the process of being done. So you know, we, we've addressed some of the issues uh, that, that you're, you're bringing up, okay, and, and we're moving forward. So there's, there's, there's nothing new with what you're, what you're bringing to the table here. Uh, these are discussions that, that, that we've been having. We, we've talked about uh, Concord Street, all right, but then there's, a, there's a, a little fly in the ointment, maybe an elephant, uh, on, on our back, and, and, and that has to do with Martin's Pond. That's a big issue out there. There's a big concern about the quality of the water there and the septic systems there. And uh, we could be in a situation where the state says, oh, now you have this kind of money, then uh, um, 
you know, it's time to take care of Martin's Pond first, and that's always been a, been a big uh, issue uh, for us. Um, the the um, uh, you know, so so that's that's a concern that I have. You know, we're bringing in MWRA water now too, and that's a, that's a very important thing. I know some people are not happy with that, uh, uh, but but it's very important that that we do that. Do I'm, either of you have concerns about the MWRA? Uh, uh, well. No, I, I, don't, I don't have any concerns when I compare it to our situation now, okay? Uh, we're, we're, we have been in a situation where we've been vulnerable, okay, to water cutoff, and it has happened, uh, where the water has been cut off from us at a last minute notice and we had to come down to a special meeting and put on a uh, uh, water restrictions, uh, severe water restrictions, uh, let's say maybe five years ago or something like that, I, you know, can't recall uh, the specific date, but so we had to deal with that. So with the MWRA water, okay, uh, we'll get an inflow of water that 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 will be very very important to us. Plus, you know, uh, as I understand it, that uh, uh, the state is willing to pay for the pumping station for us. Uh, they made a commitment uh, uh, to us to do that, okay, and that's really good. So that that that'll help us. And, and I I was involved. Um, uh, with the uh, discussions on the uh, uh, connection at the, the town line with, with Reading uh, and, and with the neighbors that uh, that were involved, uh, making sure that those neighbors, uh, th th their rights were protected because there was a right-of-way issue and we wanted to make sure that uh, uh, they were treated uh, uh, properly with the whole process. And, uh, and we did. I mean, we, we very accommodating uh, for them. So because uh, there are two, two properties involved. So MWRA is a, is, is a big thing for, for our town as well. Mr. Shelton, any thoughts on that? Yeah, MWRA is a good thing because we, we were being held up by Andover on the water in the past. We all know the story there. Also, you're going to have a, a, a supply of water that you know you're going to have and there's not going to be any issues. Let's talk about the Reading piece, though. I have relationships with, with most of the selectmen in Reading right now through my time with the chamber. We're going to have to work with them with the water. And also, if we sewerage Concord Street, that's going to go through Reading. So, you know, we're going to have to have relationships with neighboring towns. I have those relationships now, and I would like to bring that to our board. So when we work with them on these projects, we, you know, it's got to be a give and take. It's a negotiation, and, you know, we have to get something out of them. They have to get something out of us. It's got to make sense for both sides. Mm -hmm. We have three questions from the audience that I want to try to get through in the next 10 minutes or so, and then we'll have some time for your closing statements as well. If anybody else has questions, please feel free to send them up now. Uh, the first one I have here is... Uh, directed to Mr. Schultz, although Mr. Ewell will also have the ability to respond. Uh, Mr. Schultz, how do you plan to be knowledgeable and ready to tackle and address the wide variety of issues presented to the Board of Selectmen beyond the new hot issue of bathrooms? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I'm not going to address the bathroom issue right now, but as far as the other issues involved, I educate myself. I mean, I'm, I feel like I'm an educated guy. I'm well informed. I pay attention to what's going on. I watch the meetings. I understand what the issues are before the town. I also understand what issues should be a priority. I think that's important too. We don't need to be worried about whether we're plowing the sidewalks on 28 when we have a commercial base that's lagging. We don't have to worry about the bathrooms at the football field when we don't have enough money to fund our schools with a $600,000 budget gap. We need to worry about big picture things and we need to give the tools to our school committee and the revenue to our school committee so they can do the things they do to make the schools even better. There's issues like when we start languages in our school, um, you know, the kindergarten issue. These issues need to be dealt with, need to be dealt with, with money you can't tax the residents any further. I don't mean to be a broken record on that issue, but I, and I believe my opponent agrees with me on that. We can't tax the residents any further, but we have to increase revenue. We can talk about all these things that we've been involved in and so on and so on, but Mr. Yule's been on the board six years. I still don't see Conquer Street being flipped over. I still see 28 looking the way it looks. I work with these businesses. I know all the business owners pretty much that are involved in the chamber. I've never seen Mr. Yule at a Chamber of Commerce event. I don't know if he knows the business and how to work with them. It's important we get the business sector going. That's going to increase the revenue. It's going to enable us to do the things we want to do as a town moving forward. Mr. Ewell, do you have a response? Uh, uh, yes, I do. Um, the, um, when I first ran for office back in uh, 2009, I was asked to run. Some of the people in here uh, supported me and, and uh, requested that that I, I step, or they're looking for me, someone like myself to step forward. And before I did, I had to make sure that I understood, you know, that uh, uh, what it, what the requirements were to to be 
uh, not only a selectman, but to be the best possible selectman you possibly can be. So what I did is that for one year prior to my election, I went to every meeting the Board of Selectmen had. And I sat there and I attended, I had a 100% attendance record, more than anybody else on the board. Okay, so I didn't miss a meeting. I gathered as much m information as I possibly could from, from the citizen side. I didn't have the, the ability to have executive session information, so that was a restricted restriction. So, uh, but I made sure that I was very knowledgeable. My, my counterpart here has really not been to a Board of Selectmen's meeting, as I mentioned earlier. I think I think it's important. You gotta, you know, it's one thing to watch it on TV. It's another thing to sit in a room and get a feel of what's really, really going on. Uh, so I, 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 I made myself knowledgeable. I made it a point to do that, and then I ran, and then I sat on the board. And even still, then there's still a learning curve when you're on the board because there are contracts to deal with, there, there are uh, strategic plans to work on. Uh, there were many, many, many things uh, that you have to have to absorb and so on. And I, and I did that, that willingly. So I made myself knowledgeable uh, and to, to sit on the board. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Schultz? No, I'm comfortable with my knowledge of the issues. Okay, thank you. Um, this is made out to Mr. Yule. This is also from the audience. It says, uh, Mr. Yule, support for Donald Trump is concerning to those who want an inclusive, fact-based government. Please comment. Can you repeat that one again? Sure. Uh, basically, uh, the uh, audience member is saying support for Donald Trump is concerning to those who want an inclusive, fact-based government. Please comment. Just basically your thoughts on the Trump administration, I believe. I guess I don't really understand the question. Uh, uh, I don't know what Trump would have to do with North Reading. He hasn't been here, and he hasn't called me. So, um, uh, you know, the presidency of Trump is... is uh, uh, his presidency, he's doing what he thinks is best for the country, just like all of his predecessors do what they think is best for the country, just like when I come to this and I sit on this table and I say, I try to do what is best for North Reading. People are going to agree, people are going to disagree, okay? I have no issue with any of the presidents, present or in the past, on what they, what they do. I agree with some and I don't agree with some, but uh, I don't think Trump is uh, an issue here. Mr. Schultz, any thoughts on the president? I don't think town politics are partisan. I don't think school issues, police and fire issues are Democrat or Republican issues. The one thing I would say about my personal political beliefs is I'm a moderate. I don't like the wing nuts on either end of the spectrum. I think the majority of us in the middle who have common sense solutions that want to get stuff done are the people that I listen to. And uh, I don't think town pol I would ever make town politics partisan. I don't think it has a place. Well, if I may say, you know, being in the middle is halfway to nowhere, okay? Sometimes you have to go to the left and sometimes you have to go to the right, somewhere along the line. And I understand compromise. A compromise sometimes is half of nothing of what you want and half of something of what somebody else wants. So you don't, you don't look at it, you don't say you're in the, I, at least I don't, I don't say I'm in the middle, okay? It depends on what I'm looking at. I have a fundamental belief in how I deal with things. I don't compromise issues away. I address issues head on and identify which is the best solution for that issue, whatever it may be. Okay. Any uh, follow-ups, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. I, I, just, I don't think being reasonable is a negative. I think being reasonable makes common sense to most people. Okay. I agree with that. You know. um, I, I, I did, am I allowed to go back to an earlier question? Why not? Sure. Okay. Um, you know, the the um, question on uh, with the conflict of interest, okay? Um, and, and this is a belief system, more than anything else. When I was elected selectman the first time, I received a call from NRU. I'm a founder of NRU. I played a role in establishing uh, the, the goals and the purpose of NRU. Okay, and, and I'm very proud of that because it had a great impact on the town and helped the uh, school committee and the schools develop to what they are right now. Okay. But I was asked, say, okay, time for you to put your contribution in, okay? And I said, oh my God, I can't do that because now I'm a selectman and I don't want to have a conflict of interest. Now, I support the ideas. I've said at town meeting, people should join and get involved and, and, and they'll help your education uh, of your children. So I, I chose not to contribute 
people who all supported me. It, it, it almost sounds like, it doesn't sound necessarily very, quite good, but I felt it was a conflict of interest because now that I'm, I'm an elected official. So my question to uh, my opponent is that, uh, uh, are you still a member of the Chamber of Commerce? No, I resigned from the board when I announced my candidacy. My you, business is still a member, sure. I support all the business in North Reading. So, so, so you're still a member through your business as a, a Chamber of Commerce? Yes. Okay. So I would consider that a conflict of interest. And what I would say to that is I'm also a homeowner. Does that mean I can't I have a conflict of interest when it comes to property taxes? I mean, you can go to the nth level with these well, things. It, it gets a little silly. I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I prefaced my example by an action that I took. Okay, I within the association. Okay. We get to if I could just payment. speak to that, as far as actions do speak louder than words, Mr. Yule, when he came on the board, abstained from voting for our town administrator. The chief executive officer of our town, he voted present. That's not leadership. Um, Mr. Yule. Yeah, I guess that puts me with Obama, I don't know. Um, but I will say this, I, I will say this. I did not have an appreciation for the process that was used. I thought it could have been done better. And I expressed that, all right? So when I abstained, not present difference, when I abstained from that vote, I chose not to make that decision based on the minimal information that I had and not in agreement with the process that was being used. And I express that, and, and I think that's a fair thing. I could very simply have just simply said, oh, the majority here, you know, and, and you know, I didn't vote for the other guy either. All right, so I was being fair at that point, all right, because I, I wasn't in agreement with the process. I just think on that issue, as a selectman, you have a duty to educate yourself, whether you're new to the board or been on the board 30 years. The town administrator is our chief executive. That's the most important person we're going to hire or appoint as a board. I think it's, it's very important that you educate yourself and you, you, you can't abstain from that vote. I, I just don't see how you can do that. Got one more reader question. Two days. <laughs> Two days. Uh, uh, one more audience question. Uh, the town, Mr. Um, Yule of you, I believe this one is directed more toward you. However, um, the member is asking about um, the ongoing negotiations and health care providers for the town. And um, she's asking for an update. However, I'm wondering if you would just more care to speak to the um, issue of health care for the town and the ongoing. Well, I don't think I can do that because, first of all, I'm not involved in negotiations with the health care. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so I. I just like with the uh, TA, I don't have enough information for me to make a decision on that. Because you know, I, I do benefit from it. Okay, so, you know, I think they should give us great health care. <laughs> you know, but, you know, that, that's, not, that's not for me. That's, that's not a, a conversation that I should have. Mr. Schultz is a candidate for the board. Well, and again, I, you know, I own a house here. I wouldn't recuse myself from a DPW discussion on snow plowing because I own a house and I benefit by the plow going by my street. You know, I, again, it's, it's a refusal to take a stand on the key issues. Healthcare is one of the biggest expenses we have on the town side. You know, so my opponent is abstaining from or recusing himself on, on health care and on those issues that cost money, abstained on the town administrator vote. I mean, I think we need somebody that's going to make tough decisions. I'm not afraid to do I, that. I, 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 do, I do need to respond to that yep. because he, this is a lawyer that's talking, correct? Right? You're a lawyer. Yes. Okay. This is an ethics issue. <laughs> I have an ethics commission that I have to re, uh, be responsive to. Okay? If I take a stand on this under an environment like this, running for office, okay, then, then the, I'm in violation of the ethics commission, and you're asking me to, to, to speak on an issue that, that – I'm going to get in trouble for, I can serve time for, I could lose my seat for. Well, as a lawyer, I don't yeah. think you're going to serve time. So, you know, well, it all depends on who's defending me. <laughs> I think, though, what's important, though, assuming arguendo, he does have a, a conflict. I don't, I'm sure you called the Ethics Commission. I'm not questioning that at all. We can't have selectmen who have conflicts on these major issues. These are major issues that affect the town. We've got to have selectmen that can actually vote on these issues. We have four members We have a well. uh, Facebook question that just came in late regarding the, um, their, the question simply says, where is the Hillview move going? Um, just have a couple seconds for that. The Hillview right. move? Yeah, that's what we've just received. That's money. money. Oh, the Hillview <laughs> money going. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, uh, the, the, Hill, the Hillview money uh, 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 is, is, is used to help cover its bonds and uh, make sure that uh, they, they remain uh, a solvent. Uh, the, one of the aspects of the, uh, it, it, it's for operational purposes. Uh, that's, that's where that uh, money basically goes. The, 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 uh, don't forget, they, they bonded the uh, turf field for us. Uh, for a million plus dollars or uh, thereabouts, and um, uh, so the money goes to to uh, operationally. Now, when when their uh, bonds mature, they're going to be able to uh, they'll have more money available, and th that money goes towards open space. That's what it's used for. Anything on Hillview? No, I would agree with that. It's done a lot of good for the town. I think we all would yeah. agree on that. Okay. We're yeah. at the end of the hour. If you just um, we have closing candidate statements, uh, just please keep it under three minutes each. Um, Mr. Schultz, you want to go? Sure. Again, I'd like to thank everybody who came here tonight and the folks who supported this debate and also the voters. And I'm asking for your vote on May 2nd. You've heard differing ways of running the town from uh, Mr. Yule and myself. And first of all, I want to thank Mr. Yule, and I mean this sincerely. He's done this for six years. He's not doing it for the pay, that's for sure. I gave and, myself uh, a raise. He's volunteering his time, and that's very admirable, and I do thank him for that. We just have very different visions of the town, and especially how finance works. Um, I think we have to look at this more like a business in the sense that I know one of the things recently with the high school football field bathrooms is the issue of using some money we save from there for, to fund the budget gap in the school budget. You cannot fiscally fund budget gaps with one time money chunks from other areas. The reasoning is, first of all, that's not financially prudent. Second of all, what's going to happen the next year when you don't have that money? Are you going to cut that teacher you just hired? So these are basic finance principles that need to be fully understood and the town has to implement. I know I sound like a broken record. The residents are taxed as far as they can, especially the seniors. We have to increase our commercial tax base. The new growth in the commercial tax base, I would earmark some of that JT Berry money for infrastructure to put sewage on Concord Street. That's going to eventually flip that whole stretch over and get new growth in there, which will raise the assessed values, which will get more money into the town, which will lower the increase on residents. Resident taxes are going to go up, but we have to make sure they go up in check. And it's very important our schools are funded. Don't forget, roughly two-thirds of any dollar that comes in of new money goes to the schools. Well, the schools are short 600000 or so right now. By doing things like the Pulte money proceeds, like the revenue from the Pulte money uh, property taxes that come in from the over 55 development, we're going to be able to budget, budget those gaps. Now, the other issue is, I know my opponent was talking about, too, on Facebook, bringing the ride into North Reading to help seniors get around. Well, we can't bring the ride into North Reading. I spoke with Rep Representative Jones on this. North Reading is what's called a fringe community on part of the T. What that means in lay terms is we're a town whose residents use the T but don't have the T going through their town. I think it's the best way I could describe it. So. What I would propose, and what Representative Jones proposes, is that we go through the Merrimack Valley Transit Authority, get their version of the ride, also potentially look at some kind of a commuter option to one of the commuter rail buses, uh, a bus to the commuter rail train station. But we can't get the ride in here. The T's not going to bring it in here. It's a failing enterprise. They're not going to expand their services. But we can look at the Merrimack Valley Transit Authority to bring their version of the ride in to help people with disabilities or seniors get their doctor's appointments or do whatever they want to go. Okay. Mr. Yule, your closing remarks? Yes. <coughs> Um, first of all, again, I, I thank you for stepping up uh, and becoming a candidate. Um, uh, we need more, more people to do that uh, with, within the town. Uh, it's, uh, unfortunately, many times it's just down to a select few who do time in and time out uh, again get involved. Uh, I mean, I'll say this right now. If, if you're interested, you know, start getting involved in, in the community. It's, really, really important. This community didn't become what it is by people not being involved. Uh, we, you know, we stand here and on, on the grounds of people before us who have done many, many good things to this town and brought us up to where we are now. So I think it's important for people to become involved and, and please, please step forward. But I do want to say, <clears throat> I think, you know, you wonder why make a change. <coughs> Excuse me. I think both uh, uh, Mr. Schultz and I, uh, you hear what he's saying, pretty much the same thing that I'm saying. We're, we're, we're almost like an echo. All right? We're working on all the things that he's talking about, um, we're working on. So there's nothing new here. 
Uh, I have six years of working on it, so I do have an understanding and appreciation of the work and the effort that the Board of Selectmen uh, uh, go through to, to, make, to make things happen. Um, you know, regarding sidewalks, it's a small thing by itself, except when the woman was killed because there, were no, there was too much snow on the sidewalks. Uh, to her, I'm sure that was very important, uh, and, and to her family. Uh, but um, uh, so sidewalks don't look important, but they are, because there are a lot of seniors that use those sidewalks. There are children that use those sidewalks. There are runners that use those sidewalks. There are people, parents with children in carriages that use those sidewalks. Um, uh, it's very, very important uh, little thing that reflects the quality of a, of a community. Just, just like the football field reflects the quality, IRP reflects the quality, um, Ipswich River Park, I mean, um, uh, Hillview reflects the quality of this town, and sidewalks reflect the quality of this town. You drive through Wilmington, every sidewalk is cleared. I mean cleared to, to the cement. And there's no reason, we don't have as many sidewalks as they have. We should be able to do that. And we should be able to make the businesses do it as well and fulfill their obligation. Unfortunately, the, the um, um, uh, Chamber of Commerce uh, made a promise a few years ago to make sure that the sidewalks would be cleared. They didn't live up to that promise. But let me just finish with, with that, um, uh, that um, Oh, you know, all too often, there is a negative pushback in the differences of opinion, when all it is are people trying to come up with a solution that is beneficial to North Reading. We can all put our heads together and work toward a solution without vilifying others. The mean-spirited approach to governing must stop. Facts need to be put forth, ideas worked out by our elected officials on the Board of Selectmen, uh, CPC, and the School Committee along with the many volunteers and subcommittees such as FinCom and the EDC. No one has a bad idea, though there, are, there may be an alternative suggestion leading us to a better solution. All we must do is listen to one another. This is what I bring to the table, and I ask for your vote. If I just may quickly respond, I'm speaking straight into the microphone here. I'm not reading from a script as my opponent is right now. I'm telling the town how I feel or what I want to do to make it better, and I, too, am asking for your vote on May 2nd. It's, yeah, it's my own notes. It's not a script. It's Mr. Yield, do you have anything to add? Otherwise, we're out of time. Yeah, yeah I just say, I don't read from a script. I read from my notes. You have notes. And we're, I'm not reading from the school them. committee candidates um, at this point. But thank you both very much for your time, and thank you for coming. Thank you to the audience members for your questions as well. Thank, thank you. you. All set? Thank you very much, everybody. We are here with Scott Buckley and Lena Simone, the candidates for the school committee. Um, we will start with opening statements by the candidates. Um, Mrs. Simone, would you care to go first? Sure. I would love to. Thank you. I'll start for a second. My name is Lena Simone, and I'm running for school committee position. I'd like to thank Bill LaForm for moderating the debate and Al Pereira for organizing it. I'd also like to thank my fellow school committee candidate, Scott Buckley, for participating. But most importantly, I'd like to thank the voters of North Reading, and I hope that there are many that are watching this on NORCAM or on Advanced Photo. I think it's very important for everyone to understand the issues and the positions. You know, people often ask me why I'm running for school committee, and my answer is really simple. I care about the kids, the parents, the taxpayers, and the teachers of this community. Quality education is very important to me. People that know me know how passionate I am about it. Uh, I've testified at both the State House as well as the, before the Massachusetts Board of Education about the issue of overtesting. I believe very strongly that we cannot only look to North Reading to solve our problems. These problems can be such as uh, the number of assessments our children have to take or the biggest problem that the school committee faces each and every year, which is the budget. We need to be cognizant of what's happening outside of North Reading at both the federal and the state level. And until we are, we really can't understand what's going on within our own town. We're always going to be in the same spot of needing extra money every single year. An example of this is uh, Senator Jason Lewis recently introduced 
bill, Senate Bill uh, S-308, which is legislation that would not only call for a moratorium on high stakes testing, something that is very near and dear to my heart, but also call for the restructuring of Chapter 70 aid to Massachusetts community, something we have all wanted for a very long time because people in North Reading know that we uh, are terribly underfunded. My candidacy itself focuses on several issues. The first is fiscal accountability. Balancing the school budget is perhaps the most difficult task the school committee faces each year. Though my primary concern as a school committee member will be to take care of the district's needs and work towards important goals, such as reducing class sizes and increasing foreign language, especially at the middle school level, I believe we also hold a responsibility to the taxpayers of North Reading. As my dad used to say to me, if you don't have the money, don't buy it. Student privacy is another area of great concern to me. I think we must be extremely diligent in protecting our children's personal information. Recently, I brought a privacy issue to the attention of one of our school committee members. Much to my dismay, I learned that the Massachusetts Department of Education was going to be tacking on to the MCAS for 5th, 8th, and 10th graders a survey. Um, and it was going to be a school climate survey. And with this survey, they were planning on doing, quote, psychometric analysis, end quote and also to be assessing our kids' mental health, end quote. Because of my contacts across the state, I was able to find out about this prior to even our school committee learning about it, and I'm very grateful that the school committee decided to vote not to actually go ahead and have our kids take the test, or take the survey, excuse me. I'm a parent who's seen firsthand the issues both our children and our teachers have faced and continue to face. My goal is to help strike the necessary balance between the needs of our children and our teachers while also being cognizant of the budgetary concerns of our residents. Thank you very much for the, your consideration and I ask for your vote on May 2nd. Thank you. Mr. Buckley, if you care to start. <coughs> thank you. <laughs> okay, I, I too want to begin with a few thank yous. Um, thank you to the Advanced Photo, to the Transcript, to the Community Connection and NORCAM for presenting this. Thank you for Lena. For me, it's it's essential that we have discussion about education and about issues and about elections. For me, it's even more important because I don't know a lot of people. You know, I only moved here about seven years ago. My children are very young, and so I really do appreciate people listening, whether it's here today or um, online, because the only way we're going to make improvements, the only way we're going to move forward is by having discussion about the issues that are facing us today. <clears throat> I first want to just introduce myself because, again, not many people know me. Um, I am a parent of three young children. Um, I'm a husband, and I'm a lawyer and the director of operations at a company. Like many of the people that do, were not born in North Reading, I moved to North Reading because of the schools, because of the, both the size of the schools and the educational achievement of the schools. This town and the schools in particular have been amazing to me and to my children. Uh, my oldest child has some special needs. He receives a lot of therapies through the school. And honestly, I, I stayed here and I will never leave because of the way that, that my children, in particular my oldest child, has been treated. <clears throat> Before I had children, I vowed that I would be involved in my kids' education in whatever way was necessary in whatever way I could. When I had a child that had special needs, I doubled down on that because I wanted to make sure that he always received the services that he needed but also that every student received the services that they needed. Um, when my oldest son was only three years old in the preschool, I started going to PTO meetings. Uh, at a PTO meeting, I met a parent who invited me to join the community impact team's K through 12 committee. From there, I met another parent who invited me to go to NRU meetings. Um, from there, I, I was basically humbled at the first NRU meeting because I met a bunch of informed parents who knew so much more than I did about budget issues, about state issues, about educational issues, and it didn't make me not want to come back. It made me double down again about wanting to learn more about what was going on in our community and on the state level. So I started attending school committee meetings when, again, my son was three years old, and I in particular went to the budget meetings. and then. Over the last couple of years, I've gone to pretty much every meeting. <clears throat> I never planned on running for the school committee. 
I'm a big believer in not planning your life, but making sure that you're on the right path and reading the signs along the way. Um, I don't know a lot of people, but I had a lot of conversations when I learned that Mr. Bowers was not going to seek uh, re-election this year. And um, over the past couple of months, I've spoken with friends, I've spoken with uh, various selectmen, finance committee members, just about what the job entails. And through those conversations, I just thought it seemed like something that I would be able to contribute. It would be a way that I could give back to this community. It would be a way that I could ensure a strong education continues. And so because of that, I decided to run. <clears throat> My, I also think timing is important. And right now, we have a very experienced school committee. And I want to get on the school committee before issues begin. We have a good system right now. And I want to learn. I want to learn from the people that are there right now. Now, I won't be intimidated. I'll still have my voice. But I think it's, I believe in apprenticeship as a lawyer. I learned very little in law school. I learned most of it by following advanced lawyers and partners at law firms and learning from them. And so I want the opportunity to learn from the school committee and contribute a new, fresh perspective. My priorities, plain and simple, my, pri my first and foremost pri priority is North Reading. Um, I agree with Lena that there are a lot of issues that we need to address at the state, at the federal level, but I want to begin with North Reading. The budget issue is concerning to me. I manage a budget at work, and I think we need to have new ideas to address some of the budget issues, and I will talk a little bit about this tonight. But that's my first and foremost um, issue. The second thing is just in general due process. Um, as a lawyer, process is very important to me. How decisions are made, that we hear all sides, that we that we bring more people to the table. Very few people are, are involved in town politics these days. Very few people go to school committee meetings. There's been many meetings. I'm literally the only parent at the meeting. And there may be people following on NORCAM, which is great. But we need to encourage more people to participate. We need to make sure that we hear all sides and try to build a consensus to move North Reading forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for our first question, how about we begin with the uh, school department's potential budget shortfall this year? Um, both of you are vying for an open seat on the committee. Um, if you were a member of the committee, how would you respond to this um, shortfall at this point? Well, I think as I've said in the past, I feel as though the school committee members and, and the selectmen as well have been magicians of some sort to try to close this gap each and every year. So. One of the things that I think that we should be looking at is um, the selectman candidates alluded to the J.T. Berry property. And I know there's been some talk of um, having a bridge loan in between the time that we actually see the monies from that property. Now, as I think one of the candidates may have mentioned that everyone wants the money, I'm sure. But in the short term, we could potentially use that uh, for our budget. The other thing, as I also mentioned, is, again, I do believe in, in North Reading and focusing on, on North Reading, as Scott does, but I have had experience in going to the legislation and uh, testifying in front of Alice Peich, who is the uh, chairman of the Education Committee of the Senate, uh, Sonia Diaz-Chang, who's on that Senate committee. I've testified in front of the Massachusetts Board of Education and the commissioner himself. I think that we have to look outside of just North Reading because I've been here for 16 years. And each and every year, this is, this is the exact same thing that I hear. The only other thing that I'd like to add is this is a very short piece of the budget, but I did bring it up at the town uh, school committee meeting last week, and that is that we have a number of assessments that our kids take. It's great to be tested, but I also believe that our teachers are very capable of testing our students. And part of what we do is something called uh, an adaptive math assessment called iReady. Now, it's just a small part of the budget, but again, it's just looking at those small pieces. It's $16,000 a year that we spend to give our children, starting in first grade, an adaptive math assessment. I do not believe that that is something that they need. So that's another idea that I would choose. Okay. Mr. Buckley. Okay. So 
I love budgets more than I probably should. I love <laughs> spreadsheets. Um, I'm a nerd at heart, and I, I mean, I do spreadsheets for Christmas presents. My wife can tell you. Um, when I when I received the budget workshop this year from Michael Connolly on, online, I spent about five hours going through it line by line. I had about 25 to 30 questions. I called Michael Connolly before the meeting and said, you know, hey, can I just go through some of these really boring questions just to make sure I understand it? So I think diligence is important. I think understanding how to, how to create a budget is important. Every year we talk about the budget deficit, and there are, there are three main issues that are brought up as the main stumbling blocks, and they are all absolutely true. Underfunded Chapter 70, stagnant local revenues, and healthcare expenses that are rising above what our revenues are. So I completely agree with that, but I also wanna focus on what we have more control over. But with the first three, I think we do have to advocate to the state level to try to change Chapter 70 funding. But the state has financial issues right now too, and I'm not gonna put all my faith in that changing anytime soon. I applaud the selectmen for their work on the local revenues in particular and healthcare. Um, the JT Berry project, is something that most communities do not have. It is a potential windfall that we can, if we invest it smartly, we can build infrastructure and build more revenues, both from the taxation from actually having more um, people in town, but also later from having more commercial business. And so I applaud the selectmen for addressing that one. I also applaud the selectmen, in particular, Mr. Prisco, for <clears throat> his work on trying to change the way we look at healthcare funding. And I've had a lot of conversations with him about that, and he has some new ideas that, are, that other towns aren't doing that will save us a lot of money. So those are being addressed, which I appreciate. The one thing that I'm most concerned about in the budget right now is the $2.9 million expense for special education out of district placement. Now again, I just said my oldest child is on an IEP. Every child deserves an education, Every, des every child deserves to get every, each and every service that he or she may need. The problem is 39 students cannot get that in North Reading right now. So we have to spend far more than we could in town by sending them to other districts. On top of that, we get zero dollars from other districts sending students here. We need to look at this. This is just like what we're talking about the Barry Project, building <coughs> infrastructure. To me, working on this huge piece of the budget is building the infrastructure to keep students here. <clears throat> One of the line items on the budget this year, which most likely will not make it, but should, is a $63,000 position for a team chairperson at the elementary school. The idea of that position is literally to focus on building curriculum to prevent some students from needing to go out of district, to bring some students that are out of district back, and maybe even to start bringing students from other districts here. We're part of the SEAMS Collaborative, and we need to work with them and identify what are the programs. And this won't be a one-year project, but we need to have a five-year project on, let's focus on five students here, let's focus on a need in the community that we can build here, so we can reduce the 2.9 million, maybe bring tuition in, and that will then help us begin to balance a budget. We have a question. For Can I just make a comment back? Um, yes. The only comment that I want to make on that is that um, I agree with Scott that the team chairperson position is a wonderful position. In an ideal world, we would fund that position. But the long and short of it is that even <coughs> at just level services, we're over budget. So they're all niceties and things that we want to have, and perhaps in the long term, when we get more, perhaps increase our, our commercial base or you know, with Mr. Prisco dealing with the health insurance costs and having new ideas with that. That may be a wonderful thing to do, but again, we have to work within the parameters that we have right now. Yeah. And if, if I may just have one quick comment. Um, <clears throat> the problem in town politics is often that you don't have the money. You try to get from year to year. If all you do is try to get from year to year, you're never going to change the system. We need to invest, even if that means a cut in another area, we need to invest. At the school committee meeting, when I brought this up, uh, Mrs. Conant, who is in charge of special education in North Reading, said that last year she was able to create a program which saved $350,000 of out-of-district placement money 
by spending $150,000 in North Reading. That was a $200,000 savings. Michael Connolly, Mrs. Conant have worked hard on trying to develop a budget. That $63,000 will more than pay for itself. We need to find the money to change the way that we do the budget. We have a question from a um, audience member. What uh, will, um, actually Mr. Buckley, how about you? What do you consider the challenges the school committee faces in providing the best possible education for the children of North Reading? Well, I think first and foremost, the budget. You may hear me say that a few <laughs> times tonight. Um, when I think of education, I think of people, okay? And I would rather have a great group of teachers in a old building with poor resources rather than a new building with no teachers. But we need to have resources, you know? We need to find the budget to have the resources to educate our children. We also need to make sure that we are, <coughs> excuse me, we also need to make sure that we work on the class sizes. Um, North Reading should not be above the state average in class size, and that's where we are right now. The average class size is 18.9, the state average is 18. Now this is an improvement. The school committee has done a good job of focusing on this. Just a few years ago, we were, we were almost at 21 um, students per class. So we have done a good job, but we should not be over the state average. And then with any average, there are numbers that are far above and far below that. If you look at one of the positions that will not get funded this year, and this is one that we probably don't have the money for, but if you look at the high school, in the core classes of math and science, 40% of the, of the classes have 28 or more students in it. Another 40% have 25 to 27. So 80% of the classes in, a core sub, in core subjects such as math and science have, more, have 25 or more students in it. Now, we have great teachers that are capable of teaching 25 or even 30 students. We do, and you can see by the testing we've been able to do that. But we shouldn't, you know, your, the student's attention should not be divided, or the teacher's attention should not be divided between 30 students because they're not getting enough attention from those teachers. And so I think that's the main thing we have to focus on is fixing the budget so we can reduce class size and provide some more resources. you have anything? Well, my biggest thing personally, and what I hear from a lot of parents out there is that they want stronger parental and involvement. And I don't mean parental involvement in the way that I have been an involved parent, being on the Parents Association for eight years at the Hood School and being um, on the board of the, um, of the Hood School Parents Association and being part of the Middle School Enrichment Committee. I mean more communication with the schools themselves. Uh, when your child is in, in elementary school, as my fifth grader is, you get a lot of communication back and forth with your teachers. But when they start to go into middle school, what you see is there generally aren't any more conferences. I mean, you can try to lobby for a conference, and you may get one, and you may not. And it, part of it is because the teachers are so incredibly overwhelmed. I do not blame the teachers for this, but I think that we need to come up with a better system that gives parents in this community a stronger voice because I can tell you from the parents that I've spoken with they are definitely feeling a bit um, I don't want to say squashed but they're feeling as though they're not being heard so to me that would be a, a big change that I would want to make okay uh, we have a question that came in from a viewer on Facebook asking um, we'll start with Mrs. Silmo sure. how do you feel about adding recess to the elementary day is the question <laughs> I'm a huge advocate of adding recess to the elementary day. Again, for those people that know me, they know that I am really passionate about not having our children sit still for however long they're in school, the six hours, six to seven hours a day. I think when I was a kid, I had two periods of, research, of recess um, during my school day, all the way up until I was in sixth grade. The kids now get their 15 minutes, and also something that I've heard quite a bit is that there are situations where the kids get their recess taken away for disciplinary reasons. I understand children need to be disciplined, so this is not against any of the teachers out there. They know I love them, but I feel like perhaps we could use better um, 
better disciplinary tactics than taking away recess because some of these kids are ready to go crazy as it is. They need to get out of their seats and taking away the recess for these especially active kids is not necessarily the way that I would go. It's very hard because we have to have a particular amount of school minutes in a day in terms of educational minutes. But I think that I would like to see us find the time, even if it's just for 10 more minutes throughout the day, um, there was a parent, Tracy Conlin, actually, that had advocated for that. And unfortunately, she was not able to get anywhere with it, but I was very supportive of Tracy's proposal. Scott, would you? And I don't think we disagree much. Um, I think the challenge is just where you put it. I, don't, I think everybody agrees that children need to be active. They need recess. They need downtime. Um, obesity is a rising issue in, in the U.S., so anybody that could be physically active. Social, socialization. For, for me, school is all about having friends and, and socializing, and so we do need that. The problem is where do you fit it? And as Lena alluded to, there is very specific requirements about how many minutes each, each subject has to have in the schools. And we could extend the school day, but extending the school day would require more funds. And so it's, it's a circular issue here. And so obviously I think a recess is important. Um, I think state law mandates recess for uh, certain amounts of time, but the, the challenge is where does, what is it in lieu of? You know, when the proposal came up before, part of it was saying, well, if we got rid of spring break or other, other times, the problem is you'd have to extend the school day to dramatically change the recess time. If we have the money to do that, I mean, I think recess is great. I think socialization and physical exercise is important to our children. and so. It's not that I don't support recess, it's just, it's easy to say I support recess, it's just where does it fit in and what is the solution? And so if there was an issue that was raised, I'd be happy to listen to all the proposals and look at it, but I honestly don't have the knowledge right now about exactly how much, how many of those minutes are, have to go to this subject or that subject. And so that is something that we should certainly look at, but my concern is that there won't be too much additional time that's not being used right now. Have anything to add to that? Um, the only thing that I that I would like to add to that is that we do have a certain number of minutes that we have to have in terms of education. However, we also um, used to have library, for example, for our younger students. And I was quite dismayed when my daughter came home last year and told me that she really didn't have library anymore. She had digital learning, which is wonderful. But we have found the time for that. So I feel as though we may be able to squeeze out, even if it's an additional five minutes, by doing some restructuring. I do think we need to look a little more closely at the issue. Okay, let's move on to another question from the audience. Um, this is for address to Scott first. Uh, how do you feel about stipends um, paid to administration in light of the current budget gap? Well, with stipends, I mean, with any issue, I'd first need to hear all the facts, okay? And so I've started to look at the union contracts. There's five different unions in town, and so the first thing you have to do is see, does the contract address the stipend? If the contract addresses the stipend, then obviously we have to make sure that we are doing what we're contractually obligated to do. Um, I know that in some of the contracts for like extracurricular activities, for example, they seem to be all over the place, you know? Um, and I do think I, I, there was a subcommittee that was going to be reporting, I think at the end of June, about this issue, um, in particular about the stipends for various extracurricular activities. Um, I'd be curious to see what that came up with. I know with sports, there's different tiers of stipends based upon the time that is allocated. And so, you know, again, I, I think that we need to provide a lot of extracurricular activities to our, our students. And so if teachers are giving their time, they deserve stipends for, those, for the time that they invest. But I do think it's important in a tight budget to make sure that we are, we are looking at how much we are spending and what the involvement of the students are and, you know, how much time is being being spent by the uh, various administrators and teachers in those activities. I actually agree with Scott because it really depends on the situation. Now, for example, we had the, the school building project where some of the administrators gave extra time 
they gave extra time, then they should be compensated for that extra time because because that goes over and above what they were doing as part of their day-to-day -day work. But it, unless we know exactly what it's for, I really don't think it's a it's a question that neither Scott or I can necessarily answer right here in front of everyone. The one one thing I would like to add, quick, um, is kind of stealing a question from the selectman debate. Um, they talked about what are you proud of um, in town, and so. One thing that relates to this question, I'm very proud of how involved students are in North Reading. I mean, I grew up in upstate New York, and we had no user fees for sports. We had no user fees for activities. And you know what? We couldn't field the football team most years. And we were a larger school than North Reading. We couldn't feed, we had very few sports teams because nobody was involved. I'm amazed at how involved students are today. And, like, if you look, I think in, in fall, fall season, it might have been 54 or 55% of the students played a sport. Like, I love that we're in a community that even if you're not Michael Jordan, you can make a team, you know, that you can be involved because that's a part of this. And so if the way we do that is by encouraging more activities and we have to pay te for teachers for involvement, that's great because it's part of the education of our students. It's not just books. It's socialization. It's extracurricular activities. It's athletics. Um, when people ask me what I'm most proud of, it's, it's hands down. I love the school. The building is tremendous. The building committee has done a wonderful job. It's the people. It's the people. The kindnesses that I have seen over the last 16 years that I have lived here have been absolutely amazing. There are groups such as North Reading Helping Hands that help people out that have cancer and they just send them baskets, something to say, hey, we can help you get through. I agree with Scott as far as the students being involved. I think it's wonderful. I'm a huge sports fan, sports fanatic, I guess my kids will say. But I also think that what I would like to see is that there's even more attention that's placed on the other kids, the kids that perhaps are just just all about academics, which is a wonderful thing from a parental uh, perspective. That's what I would love. But also the theater kids, the kids that are in band, um, the kids that are in chorus. I think that they all deserve the same type of attention as the athletics get. Mr. Buckley, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I, I, again, I mean, just talking about the community and the people, um, I think just our, our students are great, too, in that respect. I mean, I have young children, and I've gone to some of the football games, and you know, it's a little bit intimidating for little kids, and I'm just amazed by the, the students that we have at North Reading. I mean, they all come up to my kids, and they want to sit with them. They want to, like, like, half the time, my kids run off with these older kids, and I just, I love it. I mean, I think when you talk about the people here, it's the adults, but it's also the kids. I mean, it's been passed on to them, and we have a great school system. We have a great school district. We have great students right now, and I want to help be part of that. Okay. We have another question from the audience. Um, let's start with um, Mrs. Simone. What do you see as the school committee's role in overseeing the decisions that school administrators make on behalf of our students? I think that the school committee has to have an absolute integral role. I mean, they're the ones who decide the curriculum. They are the ones who I feel as though the administrators, uh, they, of course, they have the autonomy to make those decisions. But I do believe that the bigger ones need to be something that is okay with the school committee. So, for example, I'll give you the survey, again, that I mentioned that was going to be given at the end of MCAS. The state had no, absolutely no intentions of letting any of the parents know about that survey. And I don't even know that the administration knew about the survey as of yet. It was very hush-hush thing. And if the administration didn't know about it and the school committee knew, didn't know about it, then how are the parents going to know about it and have the chance to say, you know what, I don't want my child participating. So I think it's very important that the school committee knows the decisions that the administration um, makes and also has it run by them. Um, I manage a lot of people, and I've managed people really all my life. And I am not a micromanager. Uh, by any means. I trust the people that work for me. Um, if I didn't trust people, they wouldn't work for me. And the reality is I, I do have a lot of confidence in the school administration and the teachers that we have here. Um, I do think it's important to know what's going on and to be a part of the process. But I'm also not going to, I'm not going to replace my judgment with an administrator's very often. Um, 
I, I talked in the very beginning about due process and the process by which decisions are made. I would want to know what's going on. I would want to hear all the information and why somebody is deciding to go this way or that way. But in general, as long as it seems like a reasoned decision that has thought of all the different uh, angles and the different possibilities and the consequences, I will defer to people that have the authority to make a decision in general. Can I just make a comment sure. back to that? Um, clearly, I'm not speaking of smaller decisions, but I do think that the school committee has a responsibility to oversee the larger ones. And it's not an issue of trust at all. Obviously, I think we all trust Mr. Bernard and, and, and uh, Mr. Daly and the decisions that they make, but I think it's important for the school committee to oversee the bigger ones. Okay. Uh, moving on to another question from the audience. Um, Mr. Um, Sorry, just, Mr. Buckley. Uh, what can you bring to it's school Scott, committee? That's fine. <laughs> yeah. What can you bring to the school committee regarding contract negotiations? I, I, sorry, I, I didn't catch the beginning part. What can you bring to the school committee regarding contract negotiation skills? Well, I mean, I'm an attorney. I've negotiated, you know, hundreds or thousands of contracts over uh, over my life. Um, I think, in general, with any contract, you need to just be fair. You need to be able to see the other side. I think too often in negotiations, people come in, you know, divided. They come in, you know, this is my position, this is his position or their position. They've dug their trenches already, and that's not how contracts should begin. You begin by talking about what you have in common. You know, you talk about, okay, here are the issues. Make sure everybody understands that. And then you have to deal with the reality. Now, there's going to be advocacy, but the first thing before advocacy is education making sure people are, understand the environment that we're in. Because you know, if we had millions of dollars left over, we can be more generous in contracts. You know? On the other hand, if we're tight, we can't be. But you have to be able to see the other side. You have to be able to um, not be judgmental, not be too short with people, not just accuse them of being greedy or whatever. You, you need to be able to just communicate with each other and you know, because we all at the end of the day, with every union, we all have the same interest at the end of the day. It's making North Reading better. It's protecting our children. It's, it's making sure we have a strong education system. And I don't think anybody disagrees with that. And so we just can't forget that in the middle of the advocacy stage. As far as contract negotiations, I'm not an attorney, but I have a 15-year-old and an 11-year-old, and I'm telling you, I negotiate on a daily basis with those two. Um, I agree with Scott. I think, above all else, you have to be fair. You have to see both sides of the issue. But I also think that you have to have a reality check. And again, I, 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 I know that I keep going back to the same points of the money available, the money available, the money available. but. If it's not there, it's just plain not there. So I think that we have to try to make sure that we, in terms of contract negotiations, pay our teachers equitably uh, as much as we can because they're wonderful. I know this firsthand from having my kids go through the school system. But I also think that, again, there has to be a reality check of what we can afford, not over-promise um, and not uh, under-deliver. Sure. Yes. Two more quick points. Um, in general, I think when you pay for, when you have unions, you have people that are more invested in the process. You know, they plan on being there longer. They have pensions. They're going to make decisions that are that are better for the schools rather than a private company. And so there is value in having the union, unions and making sure you recognize that and appreciate them. Um, I also think with contracts, the one thing that I would change a little bit. <coughs> Right now, contracts are negotiated very piecemeal. You know, all town employees are town employees. All the money comes from the same pot. You know, the school has five different unions that they negotiate. I looked online at the, when I was looking at the contracts, four different people negotiated those five different contracts. I think we can try, when we're being fair, to try to have some, you know, some base level. Um, one concern that I have, one of the reasons our budget is tight this year is because in general, you have about a 6 to 7% raise over three years for most unions in town. But they're not distributed the same way. Sometimes they're distributed 2%, 2%, 2%. Other times, it's 1%, 2%, 3%. If you're going to do 1, 2, 3, when 80, 83 to 
of the school budget are the contracts in town, 1% is a huge amount of money. And so if you're going to do, if you're going to do one, two, three, we have to make sure that we're planning in the year of the 1% for the 3%, you know? And I'm not saying you change the amounts at all, but when we can to try to keep the expenses even, you know? And so rather than doing one, two, three, try to do two, 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 I think that can make a difference in balancing a budget. We have a number of questions actually that we've been receiving just now. Um, one of them would be, uh, let's go with Lena. Sure. What changes would you make to the school board and how it operates and communicates with the community? Well, I think the school board's done a great job. I, I wouldn't change necessarily the way the school board operates. I mean, I'm a fan. I wouldn't be running for the position if I wasn't because if I am elected, I will be with these other people on the committee. As far as um, the actual, uh, I guess, the way that they, that they run, did you say? Was that the second part of the question? I'm oh, sorry, um, I just missed the second part. Yeah, the, um, how it operates and communicates with the community. How it operates and communicates in the community. Uh, the community. I would say that um, Mel Webster has literally taken on the lion's share of at least doing the, the online communicating with the committee, um, with the community, excuse me. And he's done a great job. Personally, I would try to make sure that we have at least one other person that takes on that. And I know Mel does it kind of as a labor of love. He does enjoy interacting with the community. But when you interact with the community that much, you also take an awful lot of heat. So I think that I would like to see a little bit more uh, online communication with the community um, because I see a lot of it on the community connection, and that's great. But we also have other avenues other than just Facebook. Scott? I would appoint Jerry Venezia as the um, North Reading Community Connection <laughs> representative. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> I think it's important for parents to be involved. Um, I think it's important for parents to be involved in the schools and making sure that we are scheduling meetings that are convenient um, is important. I mean, I know some people were upset the other day that one of the more important school committee meetings was on Passover. And you know, just making sure that we're thinking about that. We have great technology nowadays. Um, I think the school committee's made great strides in trying to get information out. Uh, Mel's been great on the community connect connection page. Um, Michael Connolly did some, a series of videos this year that explained the budget, which was really useful. Um, he's had great materials. On the website, there's a lot of great materials. But it's not interactive. So one thing that I would want is I would want to explore having a webinar. You know, when we have these important meetings, just like right now, we're having this question and answer, and people are able to type in questions. I think if we, when we're presenting some of these, um, having some of these important meetings, especially around the budget, if the same PowerPoint that Mr. Connolly is presenting can be presented as a webinar, and then people that are sitting at home can still type in questions and participate. And so I think those are the minor ways in which we can make some um, tweaks in order to try to reach more people. Do you have anything to add? No, I don't think so. OK, here's a question. Um, one of the audience members notes that there's a number of high school and middle, uh, middle school students using more alcohol and drugs. Uh, would you be in favor? Scott, of supporting health teachers at younger grades, such as grades five and six? Yes, if not before then, honestly. I mean, I think addiction starts early. Um, and I think we have a great youth services program in, in town. And so I think, you know, Amy Luckowitz in particular has been phenomenal for this town. And so I would absolutely support, um, you know, introducing people early. I mean, I. I grew up in upstate New York, and I don't know if we had it here, but you know the D.A.R.E. program. And I still remember that. I still remember the police officers coming into the school. And it wasn't, you know, don't do this, don't do that. It was, you know, it was more involved. It was, you know, just meeting the police and talking about it. Um, my, my kindergarten student came home the other day, and he saw somebody smoking on TV. And he said, you know, that'll turn your lungs black. You know, and it's like in kindergarten, he got that and he knew you shouldn't be smoking. And so we absolutely need to be educating children early because they pick up on things very early. Absolutely. I agree 100 percent. I think that you, the earlier that you can expose the kids to those types of conversations, the better. Um, my only caveat that I would say is if we're talking about alcohol and drug education, I'm 100% behind it. I think that either way, I do think that the parents 
should be able to have access to the curriculum. And if there's anything that they find uncomfortable, they should be able to um, refuse it on behalf of their student. Okay. Anything to add, Scott? No. Okay. We are going to continue. We have a number of questions. Uh, one of the audience members says, um, we'll have Mrs. Simone take this one. With regard to negotiating contracts, why does this district always look to reduce from the bottom up instead of from the top down? And then the reader note, uh, the audience member notes, administration does not seem to ask to share the pain of the budget shortfall. Well, my answer to that is that I can understand why that would be bothersome to people, but if you look at our administrative costs, across uh, or as compared to other towns we're not really all that top heavy and in fact we're actually much lighter than other districts that compare to us so i don't know that that's necessarily always the case even though it feels like that um yeah that's about all i have okay uh, i object your honor leading question um, <laughs> i honestly i don't know where the conversations start because i'm not in those rooms and so um i I haven't. I, I can't. I can't speak to where they start with cuts um, because I'm not. I haven't been part of the, some of those discussions. Um, I do think that we need to have a a broad base, and it needs to be a triangle. I mean, with anything, it, with any with any pyramid, it, the cuts need to come throughout. I, I agree with um, Lena that we we do well with a small district administration, but you know we also do well with a small teaching staff and not enough paraprofessionals. And you know, like I said before, the student to teacher ratio is over the state average. Mm -hmm. So we need to work on fixing the budget and having more money so that we're not making cuts, so that we're adding to the staff rather than reducing. Do you have any follow-up, Mrs. Simone? Um, no, the, I guess the only thing that I'd like to say is that there was talk during the last budget cycle of adding a, a rather high level administrative position and it was immediately cut out. So I think that they're very conscious of that. Okay. Uh, one audience member asks for your definitions. Um, let's go with Scott. What is your definition of quality education and what does that look like in North Reading? Um, well, I guess quality education means an education that a student can access. So if they have any sort of special needs that they're getting uh, they're able to access the curriculum, and it's a well-rounded education, which includes academics, athletics, extracurricular activities, um, and in terms of North Reading, I think we provide that. We can always do better, but as I mentioned before, I mean, I'm, I'm amazed at the participation level that students have here. They're active in so many different ways, and so I do think we provide a challenging education. We do need to in, in have fine money to increase things like foreign language earlier. Um, you know, we've done a good job committing to um, digital learning. We, we just received a grant that will pay for most of the, the lion's share of um, updating our, our elementary schools so that we can put Wi-Fi in there. And you know, we have to come up with about $56,000 of, I think the project was what, three, I have it here somewhere, almost $300,000 to begin with. And so that is something that can help us get to the next level by you know, incorporating digital learning more. The biggest component to me of quality education is treating each child as an individual. And that is something that I don't think always happens. I, I, and I'm talking about statewide, not just at the North Reading level. I believe that the kids, as Scott said, need to have a well-rounded education. I also believe that we need to um, look, take a closer look at library time. And I know it sounds silly, but the loss of library, to me, was a big blow for the kids in the upper elementary grades. Um, my daughter actually, we had won an auction item that was uh, librarian of the day, and she told me it was the best day of her life. She never had a better day. And I think it's really important because giving a child five minutes to pick out a book, it, it does not really foster their love of learning. We had Coralie Craig, who was our librarian at the Hood School, and she was just wonderful. The kids would come out of library and they would be so excited um, when I would volunteer, which I did every week. Um, in the library, they would come out and be so excited about a new author and, oh, Mrs. Craig, can you show me where there might be more books? When you take away that library time, you're really um, taking away the child's most valuable asset, which is their imagination. 
It's not something that you can get. Again, I support digital learning wholeheartedly. It's extremely important, but that is something that I believe we need to get back to. Scott, do you have? I mean, that. I okay. think we're in agreement on most issues today. <laughs> yeah, sure. I have a um, Facebook question actually uh, directed to um, Lena. Actually, um, the viewer has uh, reviewed your tweets and is concerned um, about your support for Donald Trump and school vouchers. Would you care to discuss the school vouchers issue for a moment? Um, it's it's. Uh, uh, that's an interesting interesting question because I actually don't support school vouchers. I voted against the charter school bill. Um, so I don't know if we're just talking about uh, a gotcha question or what have you. So, Scott, what do you think about school vouchers? Uh, I don't tweet, so I have no tweets on the subject. <laughs> Any thoughts um, on it? I would I say, don't. in general, first and foremost, I want people to understand that school vouchers is not an issue that the North Reading School Committee would address. Um, you know, last year when the when the state question came up, the school committee pretty clearly said that we're not in favor of it. Um, I, I agree with that. As a member, if I'm, if I'm a member of the school committee, I need to think of North Reading's needs. And um, I, I don't think that vouchers would be good for North Reading, uh, plain and simple. Um, I, don't, I also don't think they would greatly impact North Reading. But to the extent that they have an impact, I think it would be a negative impact. Um, I don't believe that vouchers are good for public education uh, overall. and. My, one of my other concerns is that with vouchers, um, while it probably isn't legal in practice, it seems from what I've read, that they often do not allow special education students in as much. And so that puts more of a burden back on the public schools to educate special education students and the cost to educate those students even, even more. So the pu public school would be losing revenue by students leaving and the expenses would be increasing further. So I, I would not support vouchers. Okay. Can I just add one point Certainly. to that? I, that I, Scott really touched on something that I think is very important. It's not an apples to apples comparison. So everyone believes that every child deserves the proper education. And if a child is in an inner city and they're not getting the right education, every parent should be able to make the choice as to how their child is educated. Perhaps that is a voucher. However, the system right now is not equitable because, as Scott said, they are not taking the same amount of special education students as the regular public schools are. So that is something that I would never support. Okay. Uh, we have another question from uh, Facebook regarding um, the use of bathrooms and uh, students based on their gender identity. Um, Scott, where would you stand on that issue? Well, Again, just to be clear, that so people know, Massachusetts, Massachusetts law says that uh, a transgender student is allowed to use the bathroom of you know that he or she defines themselves by, and so that's what the North Reading policy also says. And so I agree with that. I support it. I don't know a lot about transgender issues. When the issue came up a, a year or two ago, and the school committee was looking at it, I was interested because I like learning. I like hearing new opinions and. With any, with any decision I would make, the first stage is really narrowly defining what the problem is. And my understanding was that the problem is there was a few students who identified with a sex that they were not born as. And they lived their life, but let's just as, as an example, they lived, they lived their life as a boy. They go through the whole day as a boy. But then they were forced to go to a, a female bathroom. And that was causing them problems. So people were talking about that. Now, when the issue came up, the first thing I would ask is, well, what's the harm on the other side? What's the harm of the bill? And hundreds of students signed a petition that said, we have no problem with uh, a transgender student using the bathroom of his or her choice. And you know, I haven't heard a competing harm on the other side. And so I think the policy is fair. It allows people to be who they are. And I would not vote to change the policy. I agree with Scott that it, it, it's, it's Massachusetts, it's settled law. I mean, that's the policy. And the school committee voted prior to that, and they followed what they knew was going to be happening as far as the settled law was concerned. Now, the issue that I had about this, and it's not about a transgendered issue, it's about a privacy issue. My eighth grade daughter came home last year, first week of gym, and said, hey, Mom, I love the new school. It's great. But guess what? There aren't any changing stalls in the bathrooms. I said, you can't, I just didn't believe her, honestly. I said, this can't be true, it's a brand new school. 
Turns out that I had one of the school committee members um, take a walk through, and, and, it, and it was true, and it's made you just one of, been one of those things that fell by the wayside. There was a lot to work on with the schools. But it was a concern of mine because when I was that age, and I have another daughter who's just about to go into middle school, I just remembered my very painfully shy, believe it or not, self at that age. And I would have been mortified if I had to change in front of other people when I was just beginning to go through puberty. So I don't think it matters what your gender is or whether you're tran transgendered or not. Every student deserves privacy if they so choose. So I brought it to one of the school committee members' um, attention. It was Julie Kopke. And Julie was very gracious in tolerating my many, many emails and calls and texts to try to get, come to a solution. And I'm so pleased to say that the administration worked with Julie and was able to get portable changing stalls put into the middle school locker rooms. OK, uh, one more. Well, we have several questions. Um, audience member notes that there are always budget shortfalls. Um, Lena, where do you prioritize budget cuts when they have to be made? Well, I can tell you where, uh, in terms of priorities, staff, teachers, they're at the very tippity top. Um, we just don't function without them. And those are the people that are, we're entrusting our children with every single day. I would look more at administrative costs, and by administrative costs I mean things such as um, assessment software, as I had mentioned. That's not mandated by the state. Um, I, I find it very hard to believe that it costs the same to give children tests uh, on paper uh, that it does to spend a certain amount of money each and every year have an ongoing cost. So that's, uh, that's how I would look at it. Scott. Well, I mean, I agree to the extent that, as I said before, education is about the teachers. It's about the people. And so the people should be the last group that is cut. Um, we have done we have been painfully um, short in operating expenses over the last few years. Um, we, we are very fortunate. We have a very generous community here. And when we cut things, our, our students don't go without. It gets picked up by a parent donating something or a PTO donating something or teachers coming out of their own pocket to pay for things. But we always start with operating budgets. And I understand, because you want to keep class sizes small. You want to keep teachers there. So. I would also start there. Um, in terms of things like the assessment tools, my only concern would be what's the alternative. If, if it's something that needs to be done, um, sometimes a $15,000 system may you know, save a lot of teachers' time. And so we always have to look at what the solutions are. But I mean, I think everybody in the school committee understands that the last thing to go should be teachers and paraprofessionals and you know, other people that are educating and, and contributing to our children's education. The only follow-up I want to say is um, two points. One with regards to the assessments. My third grader at the time was scheduled for 11 assessments. 11. That's way too much. Um, they get, they, again, I trust my teachers that they're teaching the children, and they know better than anybody else how my child is doing. They see them every day. They see how, how, you know, how they're learning. They see if they're having trouble with a particular subject. Um, again, you can assess once a year or twice a year. That's fine. But when we go the other way and start to spend money on it, I feel like that's too much. The only other point I wanted to make, and this does go, I guess, in the wrong direction, but there's been, there was a lot of talk last week about the custodians and about privatizing the custodians. And I know that the school committee and the administration are working so hard to try to close the budget gap, but I am very much not in favor of privatizing the custodians. It, it, it's very important for, for me and for the parents that have kids in the school. These custodians are more than just custodians. They are people that are alongside our children every single day, and it's just not a route that I particularly would be in favor of. And, and <clears throat> my only follow-up two points here would be um, on testing and assessments, we have to be in compliance with state law. Uh, I agree that there's too much. Um, and, but that's a state issue, not the North Reading issue. And so that's not the top of my priorities. Um, and in terms of custodians, yes, again, custodians are a part of the educational experience as well. I mean, I've, when this issue came up, I started hearing from people that were reaching out to me and saying, did you know that custodians are sometimes on, on a student's IEP? 
there's actually been custodians on the IEP as you know, a way to help a child in the school. And so it should be the last thing that's cut. But again, it's easy to say, I want this, I want that, I want this other thing. What we have to do is we have to dig down and we have to change the structure. We have to work, we have to find some money that we can save, you know, and that's what I want to do. I want to target the out of district expenses because that's where I think we can save some money to save some of these other programs. And, and I know we need to move on, but I just need to just correct one point. The only assessments that are mandated, and it's the state is mandated to administer the MCAS, all the other assessments are not mandated. Well, They're just a choice. But the only problem about assessments, and I think when this was brought up at the school committee meeting, Dr. Daly stood up and said, well, the way that we catch some of the needs of students is by doing these assessments early. And it'll cost far more if we, if we don't assess, if we don't find the challenges that students are having early on. And so, again, I mean, I think we need to, we're, we're both in favor of making sure students get an accessible education. And I think that does involve looking at the students early on to see what their needs are to make sure that they are getting the services early on that they need. But again, all due respect to, to Scott, uh, having had a, 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 having a fifth grader and an eighth grader, they have gone through years of these multiple assessments. And when you have children who are younger just coming up, they're just starting to get a taste of it. And this is just what I hear from parents over and over and over again. My goodness, they're getting assessed again. When are they learning? So if you're talking 11 assessments for sessions, for example, you're talking 11 hours of just testing. That's not counting the math test they have next week, or the history test, or the science test. We need to let our teachers teach. I'll yield. <laughs> All right, we'll move on to, um, we just have a couple of uh, final questions here. Um, one of the audience members asks if the uh, candidates are able to define the three categories of paraprofessionals and what their responsibilities are to the students. Just, I guess any thoughts on the paraprofessionals as we... Well, I think on. the paraprofessionals are, are obviously very valuable to the system and sometimes the unsung heroes, too. Um, some of the classes have the extra paras in them, and they're definitely some of the more challenging classes. And I know that even with having the para in the class, it's still tough to get through the entire school day with them. As far as the three categories of paraprofessionals, I can't name them off the top of my head to you. I'm not going to pretend that I'm this wealth of knowledge and knowing everything about the system. Yeah, and, and I have a feeling I know where the question came from, and you know, I'll be honest, I don't, I, I don't. I mean, one of, my, one of my goals, when I started, when I decided I was going to run, I first wanted to speak with the selectmen, and I wanted to speak with the finance committee, and I wanted to speak with the other school committee members to understand what the challenges were. Um, and then I wanted to look at the budget and make sure I understood that. And one of the things that's printed out on my desk right now are all five union contracts where I want to learn, because I want to understand that, because if I'm elected on May 2nd, I want to make sure that on May 3rd, I am fairly up to speed about as many issues as I can. And so um, I have a lot more learning to do. I have a lot more you know, reading to do. Um, I promise to do it, but I'm not there yet. Um, I'm not an educator. I'm not a curriculum expert. Um, I think I will be good in this role in certain areas from the very beginning, and there's other areas that I think I can grow in. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Uh, we just have one final question. I believe it actually would tie into your closing statements most likely. Uh, basically, the audience member asks, what skill set and experience do you bring to the table as a member of the school committee? If you'd like to just proceed with your closing statements. Um, Mr. Buckley, sure. you went second at the beginning, if you'd like to. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I guess the skill set in general I'll address, and then I'll go to okay. more of a con um, concluding statement. Um, I'm measured. I'm reasoned. I, I'm interested in, in issues. I want to hear all sides. Um, I don't see a lot of black and white. Uh, I respect people that do, and I, I love people that are very strong and opinionated about one thing or another, but that's not me. I can almost always see both sides of it. And so I think what I will, will bring is just a reasoned approach to things. Um, I'm good with details. I'm good with numbers. Um, I think one of my sayings at work is diligence, not brilliance. I think in most professions, you don't have to be brilliant to be good and successful. You have to be diligent. Careless errors, stupid errors, lazy errors are what, are what upset people. Um, as my concluding statement, just very quickly, again, I want to thank the people that came here. I 
was surprised at how many questions we had, but I love it. I love the discussion. Yeah, um, I think this was a great debate, and I hope this allowed people that are that are listening to this to you know really get to know us a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> I want to remind people that this is a three-year position. So a lot of what you're voting for is the person, you know, the process that they're going to go by. Because the reality is, while we have some issues facing North Reading right now, and I think the budget is the most important one, in all likelihood, when you're judging one of us in three years, the most important issue to you hasn't even come up yet today. You know, there are going to be issues that come up. There are going to be challenges that we have. and so. You need to make sure you cast the vote for the person, not that you like the most or you know the most, but the person that you really think will represent you the best when making a decision about an issue that we're not even talking about today. Um, I want to talk, lastly, a little bit about my fears. Um, I, I have done very well in my life, and a lot of it's because I'm afraid to fail. Um, I work hard because I don't want to look stupid on a test. I, I, I just really, I mean, I'm afraid to fail. Um, as an attorney, I'm even more afraid to fail for my clients because, you know, people are trusting you to do your best for them. And so I do not cut corners. And if I'm elected to represent the town of North Reading, to address educational issues in a school that my children are, are attending, that's a very, very high standard to me. And I want to make sure that I, that I don't fail anybody, that, I, that every student in North Reading gets a good education. And you know, I can't promise to always be right. I will not promise to always agree with you. But I will promise to always do the work, to always listen, and do my best to try to make a reasoned decision that I think is best for everyone. So I would appreciate your support on May 2nd. Um, I appreciate Lena having a, a nice conversation with us tonight. <laughs> and thank you, everyone. Come. If this you could just long. repeat for me what the last, uh, yes, the last, the last question um, was. The thank final you. question from the audience was, what skill set and experience do you bring to the table as a member of the school committee? And then you can just go into your closing sure. statement. Um, prior to becoming a mother, I was in sales for a very long time. So while some people will say, I think everyone who knows me knows that I'm very passionate, very passionate about education. I spent the entire last year collecting over 100,000 signatures for a ballot question. I think people know that about me. My uh, blue clipboard was so infamous, I've got the red one today, that uh, one of my daughter's friends actually wanted to dress up as me for Halloween with a blue clipboard. So um, I guess I took that as a compliment. It may, she may have been making fun of me, I don't know. but. Um, for me, education is paramount, and just because I'm passionate about education and I am very firm in the things that I believe in, that doesn't mean that I'm inflexible or that, that I'm stubborn. Being in sales for such a long time, you really have to be good at negotiating. You really have to be good about, more than anything else, listening. And I guess it brings me to my, my closing statement beyond saying thank you so much to you, Bill, and to Al, and to NORCAM, and to the people in the audience, and the voters, and everyone listening, and also to the uh, administrators of the North Reading Community Connection. We forgot them last time. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here and, and attending. And Scott, thank you so much for having a nice, cordial conversation with me. I appreciate it. Um, you know, student privacy, special ed, budgetary issues, fiscal accountability are among my chief concerns. People, most people in this town probably know that I did run last year and I did lose by a mere 14 votes. And uh, it wasn't a top 10 night of my life, I will admit that, the night that I lost. But I'm really grateful I lost. And I'm grateful I lost because the overwhelming amount of support that I received after the loss was just tremendous. Um, my dad used to say to me, sometimes you have to lose to win, and, and I really agree with that. It gave me the opportunity to make a fairly quick decision that, yeah, you know what, I am going to run again. I am going to try again, because the best thing I can show my kids is that when you get knocked down, you get back up again. And that's what I chose to do, and I also want to do it because I care so much about the kids in this community the teachers in this community. Um, they wanted me, the kids wanted me, excuse me, the parents, not the kids, the parents wanted me to run again. So 
I said, you know what, I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to make sure that I put my best foot forward. And if this was just about my kids, I'd just say, okay, whatever. We'll just, you know, go along, pay our property taxes. I'll put you guys in another school, and that's the end of it. But I care very much about the kids in this community. And if I'm elected for school committee, I can tell you I will be a voice for them. I will be a voice for the parents. And um, I thank you so much for the time, and I ask for your vote on the second. Thank you both for your time, and thank you to everybody who watched. Have a great night. Thank you.